The other day, while lecturing students, a message popped on my screen. Now, I probably shouldn't have looked at it, but I couldn't resist. And it read, hey, Jose, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? <laughs> I was like, wow, what a strange question. But instantly I replied, actually, not at all. Why do you ask? And then my friend explained a social media trend highlighting how men spend a lot of time thinking about the Roman Empire. They continue by asking, so what empires do you think, do you spend time thinking about? And I took a moment and I replied, I think about late stage American empire, to which they responded, well, that's way too advanced. And then I came back to being present in my classroom and that conversation lingered. Why do I think about this empire? Maybe it's because of who I am, Jose Manuel Macias, a first generation Chicano from the edge of California, or what I call the periphery of California, the Imperial Valley, a place where disparity is apparent under different optics. One optic for me relies on the duality of a Chicano on the border. You see, I experience the privileges of life on the US side, all while bearing witness to the contrasting life just a five minute drive away to my mother's birthplace, Mexicali, Baja California. And I can confirm that disparities expand exponentially the moment you cross the border. Whereas I qualified for reduced lunch at school, my cousins did not. They either packed a lunch or bartered assignments and sometimes toys for nutrition. Whereas I was lucky to have my mom with me all the time, my cousins kissed theirs goodbye in the morning as they headed out at dawn to work in the fields for more than eight hours in the punishing dry sun. Others would say goodbye in the late evening as their parents left to work in Manquiladoras until the next day, all for a fraction of what's earned in the United States. That was on the Mexican side of the border, but even for those lucky enough to immigrate, they too faced disparity. You see, I have three cousins, each sponsored to immigrate with my great aunt and uncle, each transitioning to US grade schools at different levels. The oldest, Karen, immigrated during their senior year of high school, but you see, she did not pass the exit exam but she did not score high enough in English language arts. You see, you're tested at the 10th grade level, but try covering 10 years of English in a year. You don't. So into the fields, she went. My second cousin came in as a freshman with four years to catch up on requirements, but her struggle was taking care of the home, her younger brother, homework, and finding transportation to school. She too didn't make it her senior year, and into the fields she went. Then there's the youngest, came in as a middle schooler, lived the trauma of the eldest, the trauma of the middle, and gave up halfway through sophomore year to join family in the fields. But my cousins did not succeed for a lack of effort. I mean, picking produce in the Imperial Valley Desert, that's a tough job for anybody. It's because they were unaccounted for. It's because our community lacked the resources to mitigate transient disparities on the border. So while the inner cities live the American dream, the periphery suffers. The nuclear family suffers. And it's this disparity that creates a poverty trap, leaving plenty of labor on both sides to exploit for empire. But I think there's hope in this room for a better tomorrow, because the first step to improving is simply acknowledging the conditions that existed before the traps were laid. And as we listen to our fireside chat, we are looking to the past for the ways and the means to look forward. So as I leave this stage, I ask you, what empires do you think about? For me, it's late American empire, the disparity it creates, and the people who are left accounted for. Thank you.
you everybody for the invitation. Thank you, Professor uh, Robinson, for allowing us to be here. Thank you for the staff that organized this event. Uh, thank you, President Cedillo, for joining me this morning. So let me, um, President Cedillo and I, we agree on having a conversation and on landing this conversation on Mexico, a country that we both work on. Just don't get me into trouble, okay? I won't, I'll try. But, uh, but I do wanna start with, um, with a difficult question. It's not trouble. Um, you mentioned that uh, Mexico has a problem of rule of law, and I think nobody would question that. Nobody would question that rule of law has not improved. If anything, it has become probably worse. However, uh, over the last four years, Mexico has reduced poverty quite significantly. Mexico took out of poverty five million people, which is more people than in the last two decades. Our reduction in poverty has been probably the most important one of the century. And also, uh, we have observed a reduction in inequality. The reduction in inequality is not only from the last four years, is something that we have observed over the last two decades. So could you, uh, you know, uh, walk us through what Mexico did to improve the conditions of people, even if, it, if there is this huge problem of rule of law? <clears throat> well, first, uh, I will introduce uh, uh, a word of uh, caution okay. on what you said. Uh, poverty had been reduced consistently in the early years uh, of the century. So it is not true that what happens now, and I hope this is uh, sustained, uh, was happening before. And this is a serious academic work that has been done. I think you are making reference to the recent uh, uh, Corneval studies. And I think it's good to look not only at the rate of poverty, which after all is uh, the result of two dividing two numbers, but also at the components of how the index uh, is being done, and I have great respect for the work of, of, of Corneval. Fortunately, it's one of the few institutions mm -hmm. that has been sort of respected by the current executive. But uh, I think you have to answer two questions. One is whether, what are the factors that are driving that improvement in the ratio? Mm -hmm. of poverty. And you have to question whether those factors will be sustained, sustainable, permanent. And then, and then I think some questions will emerge there with policy consequences. I hear some of my friends saying, yes, that's uh, very significantly explained by the increase of income that families have had because of remittances from the US. And the question is whether we want to depend on remittances to reduce poverty in Mexico. Also, and this is very sad, <clears throat> you have to wonder whether the fact that the pandemic affected the most poor people in Mexico <laughs> will lead you to a lower ratio of poverty because the poor have death. The death uh, are overrepresented by the poor people in Mexico. Now, this uh, question, unfortunately, is supported by one of the figures provided mm -hmm. uh, in Corneval. And that is, they have a sub-index sub that shows that access to health services by the poor 
have collapsed in Mexico, right? So again, that will introduce a word of caution. I will say don't be triumphalistic about that. I wish it were a permanent feature. I wish I could relate it straightforwardly to policy actions. But uh, I don't think, because I haven't done serious work about that. So I will warn you to be careful about, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, schools in Mexico are having troubles. Our best school in social sciences, CEDED, which is a, a public school, is now literally under a condition of destruction, of attack from the part of the government. So maybe we will have no researchers in Mexico left to inquire what is really happening. I hope uh, some remain, and if not, in other academic centers, mm -hmm. they look at this uh, question. I've been looking at that question in my own research in Mexico, and I would say that there are three main components of the reduction in poverty. One is indeed the one you mentioned about remittances. Uh, in my own account, that uh, takes in consideration about 8% of the reduction. Then you have social programs, uh, particularly cash transfers that have increased with this government, uh, actually have doubled with this government. It's a very controversial policy because even if, even if uh, social programs have doubled, uh, the total amount of spending is not very, difficult, very different from 2018 or from 2016 or 2017. Uh, so there has been a shift basically from providing services to providing cash and that has improved uh, the income that people own so that you know, reflects on the measures of poverty. But the most important one of the <clears throat> components is income and is how salaries have increased. Uh, the minimum wage from 1977 in Mexico to 2014 diminished in 75 percent to the point that uh, in 2014 it was impossible to buy the basic uh, basket of consumption for a full-time worker in Mexico. Now over the last um, few years the minimum wage has doubled and it seems that that has been one of the main and most important drivers of the reduction in poverty. So my question would be, uh, you know, going into income, particularly labor income, what do you think Mexico can do to improve uh, income of their workers? Knowing that, and I want to caveat this because this is an important academic debate, knowing that productivity of workers has increased from 1994 to today, it hasn't increased in the last 10 years but it has increased since the 90s. So why do you think the worker has been incapable of um, capturing the increases in productivity that has happened in the Mexican economy? Well, first, again, uh, Viri, uh, and I hate to, let's say, to try to teach to a Harvard person, because I'm a Yale. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I will curb your enthusiasm about making reference to the minimum wage. I think it's great if, it, if they were increased. Uh, it's great, except I would say it's true, but probably not so relevant, because we have almost 60% of our active labor force working in the informal sector of the economy. The minimum wage uh, is relevant for the formal sector of the economy. Uh, not so relevant because actually effective wages are a multiple, is a reference for the compensation that workers receive in the formal sector of the economy. But the problem is that we have almost 60% of our labor force employed uh, in the informal sector where people have uh, very precarious social security, where uh, the law is not uh, 
enforced where people usually don't pay income taxes and so on, all the other characteristics. So I would be extremely careful about uh, boasting about uh, the minimum wage, the legal minimum wage as a driver. I think more importantly, you have to think about uh, productivity. And the reason why overall labor productivity or total factor productivity uh, has uh, performed so badly in Mexico and in other Latin American countries too, has to do with the segmentation mm -hmm. that we have in the labor market. And what I was uh, telling in my initial remarks, uh, at least implicitly, is that we have to deal with that market segmentation. I think uh, we have to look at the underlying conditions that cause that segmentation uh, and that uh, causes this uh, macroeconomic result of very low labor and total factor productivity. And my suggestion, and it is not uh, me who has elaborated that, is more that of uh, Santiago Levy, you know, the guy who helped me to do the the Progresa program, the conditional cash transfers program, which was the first uh, in the world, and which, by the way, helps a lot to explain the reduction of poverty in the early years of the century in Mexico, and had no clientelism objectives, uh, and that has been well studied um, at your university and also at MIT and others. Well, what uh, Santiago has said is, you know, we simply have to evolve into universal social security uh, with all its uh, implications. It should not be making any difference whether you are a worker in a small enterprise or you are a worker in General Motors. We should have universal social security, and you should have portability of your benefits between jobs. And that, I think, will be the way to have a more efficient use of our most important resource, which is human uh, capital. But that, of course, entails uh, very significant reforms uh, that will encounter significant political difficulties. I was suggesting, however, that it is possible to think about uh, big bargains in which the social contract could be established in those terms. You know, one thing that we've been observing empirically, still to be uh, more understood, is that even if the increases in the minimum wage has happened on the formal market, it has also uh, affected the informal market, which is something fascinating. Because uh, indeed we thought that by raising the minimum wage on formality, informality was gonna remain with very low um, labor income. However, it has somehow tinted the informal market. And it's not a one-to-one -one measure. Indeed, minimum wage has increased more on formality, but it, it has also contaminated the informal market. Uh, maybe, uh, there are two hypotheses here, maybe it is that uh, the new minimum wage informality is setting up kind of like a new minimum for the labor market in which workers decide not to offer their services even in, in informality for less than that. Or a second possibility, it's also fascinating, still to be understood, is whether the fact that people are receiving more cash from social programs is also helping create a baseline. So people are not willing for work less than they are getting in the, in the cash transfers. But let me, let me move to uh, your comment, which I also, uh, I, I'm absolutely 100% um, on agree with that, which is how do we create a universal social insurance in Mexico? How do we make sure that um, we don't have, as you mentioned, 50 million people in Mexico without access to health. 
uh, and how do we make sure that people is not paying for their own health services. In Mexico, 25% of the population, when they get sick, they go to the pharmacy instead to a doctor because there is no way to access a doctor for most of our population. And one of the main uh, concerns in terms of the universal system, this is also something that um, you mentioned um, Levy, right? Professor Levy has also mentioned, is we don't have enough money. Mexico collects about 16 points of GDP on taxes, which means that we collect less taxes than the Bahamas. Mexico is kind of like a, a fiscal paradise, but like a secret fiscal paradise that people don't know about. Um, so when you were president, this is also something you should know, guys, but when President Cedillo was president, he raised the consumption tax 15% from 10 to 15 points. And you raised income tax also quite significantly. If I remember correctly, from 36 to 40, or from 30, you have to tell us the exact numbers, but up to 40%. Um, then taxation was reduced, and you know we're here on this problem. Mm, what can be done? Why Mexico is incapable of raising taxes? Well, no, I think Mexico is capable of raising taxes. Um, I think that's the very good news. You know, it's a, an embarrassment how little relative to our needs mm -hmm. and our own capacities we raise. But the good news is that there is a huge potential. We don't need to go to the exorbitant, uh, let's say, Scandinavian rates or even the Brazilian rates. The Brazilian situation is very difficult because they already raise a, a very high proportion of their national income in taxes. That is not the Mexican case. We are, as you say, less than the Bahamas and we are at the level of, uh, said this with all due respect, the level of uh, Guatemala. So obviously we could increase our tax revenue burden significantly. But again, you come back to the, what is the big deal, mm -hmm. right? And I think there is a, a good deal to be made. You want to have a, a safer country. You want to have a country with a, a rule of law. You want to have a country with a, less uh, inequality and less uh, poverty, then let's agree on the things that need to be done. One of them being universal social security, starting with universal health coverage. But we need to agree that that has to be paid somehow. And I would claim that Mexico can have the capacity to do that. Uh, it is also not impossible to conceive how do you go about uh, the progressive realization of this uh, ideal of universal social security starting, I insist, with universal health coverage. This is a topic that has uh, taken some of my attention in, uh, in recent years. Uh, because of my work uh, with the elders when the sustainable development goals were adopted. Uh, the elders said, okay, we are going to support this. And I said, well, you are going to advocate for all of them? No, we have to be more selective. And after deliberation, uh, we said, oh, we will support or we will do advocacy for universal health coverage. Uh, and then I said, perfect, I fully endorse that. But what are we going to say about it? I said, well, that is good. I said, well, that is nice, but uh, not enough. We have to be more substantive than that. And then, of course, my, 
my fellow elders say, okay, you are going to work on that, mm. right? And I, I'm not a public health person, so I start to call people all over the world to, to learn about it and to read uh, about it. And uh, what I endeavored to do was uh, something which I have called the Universal Health uh, Coverage Charter. Uh, I was really inspired on a previous work uh, I have been involved, uh, the Natural Resource Charter with Paul Collier and Tony Benables of Oxford. Uh, they thought about uh, 10 principles that countries should follow, uh, hard principles, if they really mean to use their natural resources to support their development. And they review the literature, the da da da, and at the end they produce that uh, catalog of essential principles. And I said, well, we should do that uh, for universal health coverage. You know, and I talked to all these people, work, uh, you know, sometimes, and now we have this uh, document, which is universal health coverage charter, uh, which we are beginning to, you know, to to disseminate, uh, but I say this because this is not a utopia. <laughs> this is something doable, mm -hmm. but of course you need to, not only to pay for it, but also to, to think hard about the design, relying on good knowledge, experience of many countries, and, and, and the work that has been done so far on that. Let me stay in the tax question because I think it's a fascinating topic for Mexico. So um, when you implement the reform that we were discussing, uh, something quite shocking happened on the data, which is that tax collection barely increased. It was increased by 1% of GDP. And this led a lot of academics and a lot of thinkers to start debating whether the problem in Mexico is not necessarily the rates of taxation, but evasion and illusion that happens. And we do have evidence that most of the evasion and most of the illusion is happening at the very top of the income distribution. Even if, as you mentioned, 50% of the population is informal, because of the income distribution and the capacity of generation of income, it is at the very top where people are evading and eluding more taxes. In my own research, I have shown how the top 1% in Mexico evades and eludes eight times more than the bottom 50%. And informality tends to be concentrated on the bottom with a few exceptions. So, Knowing this, what would be a path for Mexico to increase their tax collection? Well, I'm not a tax expert, but again, I will introduce an element into your macro picture. Uh, Mexico, during the 1990s, more so before, but still today, uh, or until a few years ago, had a strong reliance on oil revenues and the taxation of oil revenues uh, to have uh, the government's uh, income. Uh, maybe in your arithmetic, looking at the aggregate figures, you should take into account that uh, when I became president, I think the average price of oil uh, paid uh, for Mexican oil was something like 17 or 18 dollars. In early 1998, Mexico was receiving seven dollars. Uh, and that's a little detail that is sometimes forgotten, that Mexico, during my time, and you know, I'm not uh, complaining about bad luck, because that's what it was. We had two major shocks, the initial financial crisis 
And then we had, at the end of 1997, not to speak of the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, and so on, and the spillover effects into Mexico, but also the collapse in the oil market. Uh, but I would say that definitely the reform that was made to increase 50% the VAT was the right one, and that increased uh, revenues for the government as the others. The problem that you mentioned, of course, exists, and that is why my insistence that equality before the law is extremely important. But it's not, it, it shouldn't be just a rhetorical uh, element. Mm -hmm. uh, the state must have the means to enforce the laws, but uh, it doesn't have it because we have a weak system mm -hmm. to enforce the law. So that should be a reform on which Mexico should focus to make sure that everybody complies with the law, okay? And you have to invest on that. Invest intellectual resources, but also invest in your human capital, invest in your legal infrastructure, which is uh, interesting, you know, because uh, what we are seeing in Mexico is now the idea that uh, the judiciary should be dispossessed of two things which are very important, mm -hmm. independence and resources to do its work. And that, I think, it's really a direct hit on Mexican democracy. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about Mexican democracy because that's a fascinating topic. Indeed, there has been some uh, challenges with the current government. And there has been some concentration of uh, power in the hands of the president. People has been very critical about uh, this. However, when we look at the surveys, what Mexicans feel is completely different. And it seems that, for example, according to uh, Latino Barometro, people believe that they have never lived in a better democracy than now. People approve the president and like the president quite significantly. And also, the amount of people that believes that the Mexican system is benefiting the rich instead of the people has been reduced by half. So that's, to me, a puzzle. Why do you think that um, you know, democracy is striving to the eyes of the people, while to probably the eyes of the elites and some academics and the top layers of the society in Mexico, uh, they believe that is going backwards. Well, again, I think you have the Latin barometer figures somehow misinterpreted, uh, but I haven't really followed it uh, carefully. Uh, from, since the beginning of the century, there was an element uh, uh, in those surveys that uh, it worried me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and one is that uh, the taste for democracy has never shown very strongly for the Mexican series. And that, uh, I think, it's a failure uh, of a lot of people that have not really socialized the idea that democracy is something very important, uh, not, so, not, not only to protect individual rights, but also to have uh, a powerful instrument of development. In the Latin barometer thing, also, I, I noticed uh, something very paradox. Uh, exactly what you describe for Mexico now mm -hmm. existed for Venezuela around 2006, 2005. 
the Venezuelans thought that they were living in the greatest democracy in, Ameri in Latin America. You know, how to explain that? I don't know, I am affiliated to the economics department, to the political science department, to the School of Environmental Studies, not to the School of uh, Anthropology or Psychology. So I'm not a, an expert. Uh, why half the people, or I don't know how many people in this country believe that Mr. Trump represents the best values of this country? I don't know. I haven't studied that. But uh, I hope one day somebody explains that to me, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, uh, I, I declare my incapacity. And I worry when you start to say, oh, because the elite and the others. I mean, that's the language of populism, right? And I despise populism. When people start to divide uh, the world between the ones like me and the others, then we start to divide uh, societies. I think we have to be a little bit more careful about uh, that kind of uh, assessments. I think we just have to go for the facts, right? And the fact is that not only Mexico, but in general Latin America, we are trapped in that pre-development trap. Whether people feel good uh, because of certain gestures, uh, promises, uh, propaganda, well, that's fine, but it's, that is not relevant. That is not going to determine where the country is in the medium and long term. That's interesting that you mentioned that uh, populism is accentuating the differences that exist in Mexico because indeed those differences exist and maybe those differences hadn't been voiced enough before. The reason why there is a demand for populism in Mexico is well known. Is exactly what you mentioned before, which is that in Mexico 36% of the population is poor, the top 1% concentrates 26% of their income. The minimum wage was reduced from 1977 to 2014. Uh, Two-fifths of the workers still cannot feed their families with the money that they make. So I feel that, you know, we don't have a lot of time to discuss all this. But I feel that, uh, and this is also, there has been also some research on the U.S. about this. We need to take seriously the demands of the people. Uh, the demands of the people maybe are favoring presidents like Trump um, because we haven't been capable of offering them other possibilities that they feel attracted to. And I feel that that's a lot what is happening in Mexico too. Uh, Mexico democratized in the year 2000 and ever since we have two decades in which you know the country remains feeling kind of the same for many people. And we haven't had enough advances into providing people with basic goods and with basic services. So more than here talking about whether we despise populism or not, I feel that we need to understand that people are being attracted to that and wonder why. Wonder why people feels that presidents like Maduro or Lopez Obrador represent them and not other uh, democratic forces present in the, in the country. Um, we, have a, we have not a lot of time, so let me just ask you uh, one final question uh, about the future of Mexican democracy. What would you like to see in the next uh, president whoever becomes president of Mexico in 2024? Well, first I would like to see somebody that, as you say, listens to the people uh, and recognizes how complex our problems are. But I also would like to see somebody that uh, don't exploit those needs 
by creating a demagogic discourse, by promising things that uh, will not be delivered effectively, by not dividing either our societies, by putting forward the reforms that our country and our countries need in Latin America, that assumes full responsibility because it's very easy to blame always the others, mm -hmm. the foreigners, the Chinese, in this case of this country, you know, Mr. Trump, uh, his first step uh, as uh, when he declared that he wanted to be candidate, he said that we Mexicans were at the root of many problems in the United States, that we were criminals and rapists. And maybe that resonated for some people, but that was false. <laughs> and it was an offense. However, it worked uh, politically, you know, and uh, as this case, there are many examples in, in Latin America where politicians evade responsibility, don't tell people the truth, and say, okay, we want to solve these problems, but in order to do that, we will have to have courage, we will have to have vision, we will have to have discipline, and we may even have to have to endure some sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in one word, I would like to see a president that doesn't get elected by lying to the people, a president that doesn't govern by lying uh, to the people and by blaming others for his or her own mistakes. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. <laughs>